Should I start? That bodes well. <laughs> All right, hello. Uh, I'm Brad O'Mara. I work here. Um, <coughs> So we're going to talk about likelihood and Bayes. Okay? But because it's late in the day and stuff, we're going to have gambling. Okay? So for this. So I have a coin, and I flipped the coin and gotten this distribution. Heads, heads, tails. Okay. <coughs> and what I want you to do is guess on the next 18 flips, how many heads will I get? And I want you to take your sticky notes they handed out to you, write your name and your guess in the piece of paper. And there's no game theory here, so if one person wins or if all of you win, it's the same amount of candy. So I'm trying to pick the unpopular ones. You can no game theory, just you're the only one playing this game. <coughs> so think what your, what your guess is and why you're making it. And also, I mean, this you know, this workshop's for you, for you all. So if you have a question during it, interrupt me, ask questions. Okay, that's why we're here to teach you. Okay, is everyone written down a guess? Okay, pass it over to the end, and Joseph, could you collect it? Thanks. <coughs> so, so eight, there will be eighteen more flips. How many are going to be heads? Going from zero to eighteen. Okay. So first a little context. So why are we doing all this? Right? Why are you talking about life in Bayes? Well, for all of the methods we've been talking about, to actually get inferences to make choices between models or to make guesses about, inferences about parameters, you need to have some sort of model, some way of evaluating models. Okay, and life in Bayes are two related ways you look at data to understand the processes underlying them. Okay? <coughs> so what does all mean? So let's think about probably getting heads. Could you? So let's think about you know, a simple binomial coin flipping, big example we all know, know and love. Okay. Um, so probably again, a single heads, given probably of heads is P, is just P. Right? Not hard. Okay. <coughs> this is a probability, so it goes from 0 to 1. Right? So you have all of the range, but not everything 0 to 1. This is stuff. <coughs> probably getting two heads. P squared. Probably getting heads, and probably getting heads again. So here is that surface. Okay, so the probability of getting two heads is that. <coughs> and so when I'm looking at talk, talking about this, is saying it's the probability of the data given P. The probability of having two heads as the data given P is P squared. Okay. Another notation for it. Probably of data given p is p squared, and thus <coughs> the likelihood of p given the data is the probability of the data given p, which is p squared. So that's all the likelihood is. Okay, when you're doing the likelihood in any method, this can tell you the probability of the data. Okay. Now, if we get numbers that are sort of funny, like negative 500, that's not a probability. Right? We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But in general, likelihood is <coughs> just the probability of the data. Any questions about that? Okay. <coughs> and of course, this depends on the data. Right? So here I have three possible data sets I could have from my coin flipping example. Two tails, two heads, heads and a tail. Describe, describe the distributions. What do you see here? Uh, uh, Probably, uh, yeah, probably yes, yes. Good, okay. 
Good. What else? Mm -hmm. Right? Feels symmetrical with respect to P. Why isn't two heads symmetrical with respect to P? So as p increases, the probability of getting two heads should increase. So that's why it's increasing that way. Good. Okay. Heads. <coughs> now here I have another data set, like what we had with our case. Okay, so here's our data set. And here's the likelihood surface for our data set. We have two heads and tails. Okay. So that can be, we can actually visualize the surface, right? This is the surface. <coughs> and so maximum likelihood, I want to find what the maximum value is there. Right? And that's the maximum. Right? So we're talking about we want the maximum likelihood estimate, right? It's where this peak is high. And we have various ways of figuring that out. Approach. We can try just doing brute force and say, okay, this value, this value, this value, and we plot that curve. But whatever, we get the peak is here. Beautiful. Right? Two thirds. Right? So in our case, <coughs> two thirds of 18 is 12. So if all of a sudden that's not good, well, we'll have a lot of values at 12. Okay. So we have some here. Right? <coughs> but we have a lot more at 9. Some people are stupid. Yeah, can I can't do that. No, right? They're doing something else here. Right, so look at that. So here's the MLE, here's the some other solution. And here's other people who are doing other things. Okay. <laughs> um, as, you say, as you say in the South, bless their hearts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a monkey hood. Yeah. Alright. So <coughs> here's an example of this. Okay. So here we have continuous traits. Um and here we have you know, peak depth in finches. Okay? Classic grant work. And here is Brownian motion. And here is various rate parameters for Brownian motion. And here's likelihood of each. And the maximum is right here. So that would mean the maximum likelihood estimate for that Brownian rate parameter is you know, around 0.15 or 17. What does it look like in real life? <coughs> so as Margaret shows how we can do, we can take um, with the value of starting state and then try simulating many, many times to see what we get come up to. Right? So <coughs> here we have this distribution for this rate. Okay. This for up here. This for up here. And so, with the coin spin example, I can tell you exactly how often we're going to get exactly you know, two heads and one tail. It's a discrete number. Right? How about beat depth? I'm going to tell you the probability of getting exactly 1.3334.12555 millimeters for the beat. Right? The answer is infinitesimal likelihood. Okay? And say we can get a PDF for normal, right? probably the density function, the same thing with the likelihood. Right? Even though <coughs> it's a continuous variable, you can see the length of the world. Okay. One thing that tricks up people to hear, though, is that probability can be greater than one. Right. So the area under the curve is one, right. but the height of the curve could be higher than one. Because it's all really good. Right. But it's still fun. It's still bad. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, Mike. So there you're just simulating some rate, right? So you know, yep. the rent is a few minutes, so you're going to match that in terms of And had I chosen a rate that was too small, right, then my observed would definitely way out here, then my distribution would be far into the middle, probably of getting that speed that would be really low, right? But if you make it too wide, <coughs> you know, high probability of getting things that are higher than the sub. Great, but maximize the chance of seeing that particular beat depth. 
and it's all showing this. So, other questions about this? Okay. So, why likelihood? So, some of the properties of likelihood. So, likelihood is consistent in the correct model. Right? So, an old classic paper about the Felsen sign again, right? Show that I could get the right true and press when you couldn't, if you have the right model. Later, if you get the wrong model, some of the likelihood can fail. It's efficient. What does that mean? Usually the best estimates for the amount of data you have. Okay. This is in a world where we have you know, 38 species. Efficient estimators are nice. <coughs> um, a problem with it is it can be biased. Okay. But this bias decreases with sample size. So, so it's still more powerful than, un than unbiased estimators, but there are unbiased estimators you use instead. <laughs> One practical problem. So likelihoods can get really, really small. Okay, so here's our coin example again. <coughs> so one throw, one head, that'd be this point five. That's fine, you can put it on the computer. Five throws, point three, two throws, point five heads, this, five hundred, one fifty, this number. Okay. Your computer has finite precision. And R. And so after a while, if you get that number too small, you could say, you know. Another and then subtract a little bit from that. Are these mm -hmm. equal? And your code will say, yes, it is, they are equal. It doesn't have the resolution to tell them apart. <coughs> and if you can actually see this, if you want to, then we, you can enter this command in R and I'll tell you the precision of the numbers. And so in phylogenetics, you often get numbers that are really, really small. So the probability of having exactly A, T, 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 C, 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 T, G across you know, hundreds of species. Very, very small. I have to get exactly that, that set of bases. <coughs> and so it becomes a number that's too small to put in the computer easily. So what we do with that then, I'll check it before we, before we give up the prizes, don't worry, <laughs> um, is do a log like we could. It's put on a log scale, it's easier to deal with. We have these 20 numbers that have negative values, and they put to the left codes, that's what log like is. You could you know, take EXP of this, you could have these numbers. And they would see that they're too small, that's what it is. So we see likelihood values that are negative 44. So now you don't see the negatives, we'll say negative log of it. Yeah, sure. Just a comment. Sometimes people are worried. Sometimes people are worried that, gosh, the likelihoods are so small, or the log likelihoods are so negative. What that actually means is you've got a lot of data. There's a lot of different possible data out there. So it's a good thing that I've it's, it's only a problem if it's much smaller than what you could get under some other hypothesis. Right. That makes sense to people? So now we have a look at one model. How can you tell if, if one model is better than another model? Well, there's several approaches we can do. Okay. One is like a ratio test. Who's heard of this? So the issue with this is models have to be nested. So one has to be a restriction of the other. All right, so if I have an nice cumulative process, and <coughs> one of them has two different thetas, and one has one theta, all right, if I can reduce the two theta one to the one theta one, those are nested models. Okay? If I have a model where I have I want to only back with two thetas and then branding motion with a trend, those can't be one can't be reduced to the other, they're not nested with each other. So that's within some other model, but not within each other. You can't do a lot of ratio test for that. And so the classic you know, model test, or J model test for comparing nucleotide models. That was where we initially did this. We compare and see pairs of models and work down. Okay. This isn't used much anymore because of the disadvantages of being nested. This nested. Okay. So instead, what's most common is AIC. Okay. <coughs> it's called the AKK information criteria. This represents how much information is lost about the truth by using your model? Okay. Um, <coughs> now, as AAC is relative to AAC, that's like saying, you know, how close are we to New York? Well, I don't know how close we are to New York, but she's about 10 feet closer than I am. Okay. <coughs> and so you use these relative AAC measures. Okay. And there's a great line, so Berman Anderson wrote a canonical book about this, 
is a great line, line would say, you know, driving this, the truth drops out as a constant. Okay? So you don't need to have the true model in your set. In many cases, we think the true model isn't in our set. Right? So comparing one rate Brownian motion to two rate Brownian motion, what's the odds that mammals have one parameter or two parameters covering their body size? Pretty low. Right? So the true model is way out there in complexity. <coughs> what we're doing is we're saying, which of these bad models we have is the least bad? And there are rules of thumb about this. And you can see they're very ad hoc, right? So if two models are within two long, two AIC units of each other, they're both pretty good. Okay. If one is, you know, four, four or seven worse, there's really less support for it, or which has to do no support. <coughs> and again, it's depending on your data set size. Okay. So a lot of the comparative methods you've been doing, oftentimes the models are in this range. Running motion of the moon deck, all you're doing is doing this range. Okay, it's not super confident that I'm rejecting. One thing in the AIC world is you don't reject models, you're looking at different support for them. Okay. So it's not like you don't get a p value, you don't say, now I can loosely reject this model. So it's all less support for that model. Other questions about AIC? Okay, here's an example from a very good paper from a while ago. Um, <coughs> okay, looking at various ones of the models. And so they tried a variety motion model and an OU with one theta, and OU with three thetas, four thetas, and OU with multiple thetas. <coughs> and so you can get parameter estimates. Okay, you have the maximum of these estimates with parameters. And they also get the, AIC, the delta AIC. Okay. And then you can get relative likelihood, and from that, the weights. And they feel sort of like posture probabilities, they're not. You sort of treat them in a sort of similar way. Sort of, here I have a lot more weight for this model, 80% than for this model. But 87% isn't you know, slammed up. You can't ignore the information that model is giving us. So what do you do? What you do here is do model weighted parameter estimates. Okay. <coughs> so here I say, okay, here's a fake sigma. Right? This row right here. So all the models have a sigma. Okay. So I want to get the best app, the best estimate of sigma, I want to find the multiple models here. That's it. Okay. So this model says sigma is 0.21, going to the weight of parameter 3. So, the weighted average. Um, <coughs> this can be nice for models where you have some models have a frame and some models don't have a frame. Right? So, we could treat, you know, PEM as having an alpha parameter of zero. And this one had an estimate of zero. So, if I say how important is this alpha parameter in the models, I can get a weighted average of, of, of alpha across all the models. So, those with set to zero, those without it. You get an estimate of both. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, they come from the relative ratios, the relative likelihoods, which come from the AIC, from the <coughs> delta AIC. So the actual calculation is you take the delta AICs and then it's exponential negative 0.5 times that. That gives you the relative likelihood for each model. And you just you know, sum them up and divide each one by that sum. Yeah. Other questions about this? Okay. Um, one thing that we can do in comparative methods, we have these fights about, sometimes people care about, you know, is OU or BM the best model? Right? So people just argue, you know, <coughs> compare the delta the AC and see which one's better. And that's good, it doesn't want to go and look at the primary estimates. Because we have a lot of data set, of course, we pick a more complex model. Right? So I say, you know, I have 1,000 thousand taxa, and OU is much better. What's your alpha? Now? Alpha is 0.00001. Photogenic half life, it'll take a billion years to get, the, get to the optimum. But it's an OU model. And yes, it is, but we're going to realize that you know, it's not actually, it's not it's very strong. It's really good to be the values. Um, last time we had taught this course, 
we had an instructor who was very good at showing that you know, these actually have parent values. You know, there are actually needs of body length or body length. Like that. We want to keep that in mind when we're putting up these programs. We actually measure this. Any questions on that? All right. So, some of you guessed 12 when Kim is in the line. Right? Many of you didn't. So what are you doing here? What's your brain doing? You should guess a different number. Okay. <coughs> well, this comes from conditional probability. Okay, the, the cartoon. Um, can look at it. You can it. This is basic closet probability, right? So the probability of A given B is probably B given A. So, right? So that's fact. That's just you know looking at Venn diagrams. What we do with Bayesian is convert the labels. <coughs> so the probability of a hypothesis given the data, probably the data given the hypothesis, the probability of the hypothesis, or the probability of the data. So that's Bayes' rule. So this is not controversial. Because it's controversial whether it be a Bayesian or Franklin test and we get into fights sometimes, right? But it's not over whether this is true. This is fine. The question is what, what would you do with this? <coughs> this and so with Bayes rule again. So we call this the posterior, the posterior probability. That's what we get out. And this is actually a very nice term. Um, because what you have is you can say, okay, the probability of this hypothesis being true is 45%, 95%. It feels very good to us as scientists. Right? So this is very appealing. This is our friend, the likelihood. Okay. This is the prior. So we'll talk a little bit more what that means in a little bit. Okay. And this is the probability of the data over any hypothesis. So one way to do that is to calculate the likelihood over all possible hypotheses and add them up. And that can be hard given hypotheses, like for example, the size of tree space. And so we have we have algorithms to deal with that too. Okay. The real crux of the problem is this prior. So the prior is when you first approach the problem, knowing nothing else, okay, what's your estimate? Right? So I said to you. I'm going to give you candy for coins, getting the coin right. Look at how much kind of heads or tails I got. It's not even about coins, it's probably being you know, fair or not fair. That's your prior view. It will bring to the analysis and create the current view. Now, it can be informed from past data. The current is the first coin you've seen flipped. Right? So you can say, well, the only way I know about coins is probably going to be 50-50. You know, right? If I had something else that said, you know, it's probably going to be pulling out a rabbit out of here. Well, you know, it's again a binary option. There are very, very different prior on that. There's a very low likelihood that we'll have, have a rabbit in there. Okay. <coughs> and so, you, so, so the primary equation approaches is the, the, the answer you get out can possibly depend on this prior. Okay. And so, if I think the prior age of, the, you know, age of life is 6,000 years, and put a very strong prior on that, I get there tons of data at it. It'll take a lot of data to make it not be 6,000 years. If I had a flat prior, then I could get a bigger range. Um, <coughs> and so that's where the controversy lies. Now, with enough data here, what if it becomes large enough that for most priors, it could overwhelm it? Right? About, not for all priors. If I said, probably well, we've hedged this coin between 0 and 0.1, right? I can get heads every flip. My estimate's never going to go above 0.1. That's at my prior to that being coming to it. Any questions about that? Okay. And the prior is all over the place when doing these methods in the Bayesian context. Right? Who's used Beast? That's the same one as I Anyway, Beast is a very popular method for inferring trees, and it has you know, 20 or, or more priors. Mr. Bay is the same thing, has many, many priors. You'll always often use to use whatever the faults are. And very unlikely that your data set is the same as that of the person who first made the program. 
and yet you're, you're assuming that your beliefs are the same as their beliefs. Okay. <coughs> so we can see that, how those combine. combine. Okay, so here's our life field for the coin flipping again. You have different triers. Okay. So you could say, you know what, I know nothing about coins. I'll get a flat prior. And <coughs> you might have like it if you have to keep here and get back out, the same as people did. Flat prior. I could say, I know something about coins. I'm going to take the pair. I'm going to take the pair. I need a lot of evidence to say that the coin probably has 28. Depending on how strong your belief is, you make this narrower and narrower, or wider and wider. <coughs> or you could say, there's no bombs to be that very low, low yeah. I think coins don't have many heads on them. And the scary thing is that that's the result of that. So I put it two I put it three times and get two thirds heads. With this prior, oh yeah, they're so probably have probably about 0.17. Even though 67 percent of the time I got heads. Okay. Now then I kept flipping it, eventually they'll all converge. So there's probably the data over any hypothesis part. That can be intimidating. Are you going to add up this everything? And so an algorithm we use for this is <coughs> Markov chain Monte Carlo, which Joe talked about a little bit. Okay, so this actually means some pack a little bit. So a Markov chain is a series of steps, and each step only depends on the current state, not states further in the past. So Brownian motion is a Markov process, right? I'm moving around in front in trait space. And I got here this way, and I got here from way this way, or I got here from this way, the same problem they've got in right hand. It doesn't matter what, what, what direction I'm coming from, I don't have to worry about it. And there's armor code. So I paid money for my house. If I sell my house in a year, I don't want to lose money in my house. Right? And so my, what I paid for it in the past affects how, I, how much I sell it for now. That's not a code. <coughs> so macro changes means all, where you go next just depends on where you are right now. That's it. In Monte Carlo, the GP is sampling from a distribution. I think all these are very popular for gambling. We did today we call it, we call it Vegas style. Okay, we're going to do knock our process Vegas style. <coughs> and so now I'm use the hat store. Right? So <coughs> I would say, let's try to figure out what kind of hat you like. Right? So we could try, I could give you a whole assortment of, you know, here's hats of various gradation, gradation of color, which one do you like best? Here's half of the style of brims, which you like best. Look at it that way. Okay. We're going to integrate that over all hat space. We're going to turn you loose in a store. So you can see how you like better than the one you have on now. Put it on. Do you know the one? If it's, if it's a lot worse, don't put it on. If it's a little bit worse, you know, at random, put it on. And videotape you've gotten to the store. Okay. So if you really like baseball hats, you want to have baseball hats, there's some chance you're going to put on a cowboy hat. If you really like red baseball hats, <coughs> and so from looking at how frequently you have, how frequently you're looking at different things as you go to the store, it tells us how much you like different kinds of hats. Okay. The same thing with, with the hypothesis space. Okay. See, we do the search across this chain, you see how often we're in different, different states. That's about likelihood and fire. Okay. And that tells us how much we like it. Now, it takes, it's, it's hard for to do properly. Right? So if I put you in the store, and if you after two minutes, or you still have the same hat on. You haven't had enough time to look at all the hat space. So the Markov chain went parallel, you have enough time to sample out of it. <coughs> it could be that the hats you really love are separated from where you are now by a row of beanies. If you have to cross the beanie gal valley to get to the cowboy hats. Right? And so we have various algorithms to help you cross these valleys and have better mixing. Okay? Um, most of which we don't have them compare with yet after we choose a single Markov chain. But once you have good enough mixing, then these are actually, every time you look at something, it's a valid sample from this distribution. And so we get, we, that's how we integrate that denominator. Right, other questions about that? Okay. So in the Bayesian case, how do we compare models? Right, because AICs work, but they use only likelihood. In the Bayesian approaches, we have this prior one to bring it to. So our approach is base factors. So you compare the marginal likelihoods. Um, this sample over all your various samples. Okay? And then we have these, again, rules of thumb. Okay? 
Similar to AIC, you know, greater than 10, it's a lot of evidence, less than 10. That's one approach you can do. Um, another approach that's hot lately is reversible jump mark of chain Monte Carlo. So, in the same way, you can sample paths, I can sample models. Right? So, if I can spend time in this model and play around and try different parameters on, and then I can hop to another model and try parameters on, and see if this model's a lot better than this other model. So you switch across the model space and then we look the parameter space. Now the issue is when I first get into a new model, what are my parameters going to be? If my new parameters are always starting off with really bad values, I'm going to ever choose to go into that model space. So you have to, have, you have to be very careful to make sure you're mixing well. If you can do that, then this is a way of integrating across the models and getting across the probability for a model as well as for a parameter. Any questions about that? Another approach that's popular right now is approximate Bayesian computation. Who's heard of this? A few. Good. All right. And then I can also do it with lucky too. The idea behind this is, you know, math is hard. So for all of us at this point, you know, this is our old friend, right? We know, we know what this does. We can play with it. Great. Okay. It's not true for everyone. Okay. And for some problems, there is no nice equation like that. So now what we can do is plug and chug. Of our, you know, our means in here and such, and get the likelihood out. If we have no equation, how do we, how do we get a likelihood? What do we do? Any ideas? Imagine the coin flipping example. We don't know anything about how to flip coin, how, 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 how you know, by normal distribution. We have to figure out the probability of getting two thirds heads. We're going to do it, right? We simulate it. And that's what we're going to do here. That's what we're going to do here. Okay. So we're just empirically flip coins many times. Okay. So if we said, you know, what's the probability of heads for our coin? Well, if we know math, we could do this very fast, very efficient, okay. and get this distribution. Okay. If we don't know math, or if we're working a problem where there is no such example, no such equation, right? We're going to look at evolution of traits that have character displacement. Right? There's no model for that. We can imagine simulating that sort of thing. Same things we learned with Marguerite earlier. That's something grounding motion. Is then wiggling around, and it gets too close to something else, it pulls away. Right? That's not part of our grounding motion model. You might even have a simulation like that. Right? So that's how we can get at this. Okay. <coughs> so in this case, what we'll do is try a value. We put this point two. Okay. Simulate many, many times. How often do we get our coin, our, 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 our sequence back? Once, just there, right? So what's the probability of the data then? One tenth, great. So we've done the simulation approach to estimate probably the data is one tenth, okay? Why is it approximate? I'm going to do it 10 times, right? But what skill is not become approximate? And let's do it an infinite amount of times, right? So now we're going to do it that much. So Another case is the other issue is that here I just count exact matches, right? It's this match and this match and this match. What about for our beak depth example? So I simulate a beak of GSP to B depth. It's not going to match exactly. Right? How do I know if it's matched close enough? You have a fudge factor, an epsilon. It's like if the big depth is different by less than 0.01, I want that to match. Okay. And one thing that makes approximate Bayesian computation a little controversial is this epsilon value you choose. How does the value you choose? Another, bit, another thing to think about is what parameters you're actually matching with. Okay. <coughs> so here I can match by you know, the raw number of counts, but you know, exactly plus heads heads, or I can do the proportion of tails and heads, or I could do, you know, only the third number that comes out. Um, in the GSP case, running motion, I could simulate data and see how often I get exactly the same values. I could do it and see how often I get exactly the same ancestral state. Okay. There's different ways of summarizing your data. To put into this. There's a lot of choice that comes into that process too.
And there are actually ways to choose which some of the statistics matter most. That can also affect what answer you get. Okay. And about the number that can give you lots of information about the data to see how to So let's try this. <coughs> so here I tried 200 simulations for each of these values. Data Hoffman got an exact match to the sequence. Here we go. This is vision computation in action. So we can do more. I've done 2,000. Better fit. Um, 20,000, better fit. And 200,000, better fit. Right? And so without actually knowing any math, just knowing how to simulate, you can actually estimate this likelihood. Well, the Bayesian is what I'm going to simulate from. So what I'm actually simulating from here is a uniform prior. That we thought is the idea of prior, the prior, is the next step. So that would be my prior, and then the numbers I get out, this curve I get back out, would be the posterior probability. Any questions about that? You have to have some sort of model to run the simulation, right? which may not be an equation. Um, you know, I could, you know, create a coin and different weights on each side to figure out, you know, power of the coin. And then if you be mathematical, you know, equation to it. Um, and that's always how we simulate. Good question. Other questions about this? Right, so if, if you give a model that you really awful, you might throw that out. So I found, for example, we're looking at um, an extension to Lessi, which is looking at discrete traits of evolution and looking at how they affect the precipitation rate. And some models are too complex for the data, so you get very, very bad estimates. If we do, you know, 0.1% on that, that rate, and that rate is a billion, and everything else is a much smaller rate, even though you're weighting it down, it still has a disproportionate effect. Yes, yeah, so it's, 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 it's a little odd. You, know, you, you might need to exclude it really bad. There's one little point of the problem that would help the problem with that. Um, but it's not here if you have you know, a point in the way on one model and you have another model. It's a little bit of a problem. So I'll speak to you now. It's not going to be a problem with certain models. But it's going to be a problem with that. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a problem. Exactly on time. Um, so we now have time for discussion about this in general. So now you can sort of understand likelihood versus phase versus you know, cost of vision. Also, you do a cost of likelihood too, just take out the prior. Um, <coughs> so for your analysis, when you, you go home, you have your data to look at. Oftentimes, you have a choice of methods to use. What are you going to choose?
Ja. That's good. So, like, yeah. So, so if you have a model, do not do approximate Bayesian computation. Right? You can just, you know, plug and chuck in an equation. Don't simulate two hundred thousand times instead. You know, I'm just not sure about the equation. So, that's one you know, decision point. Okay. Now, assuming we have an equation and we can do likelihood or Bayesian approach, what are you going to do? Most of my weight, my potential probability, is between here and here. And so the Bayesian estimate would be, you know, this plus or minus this range. And the MLE would be this, which might have to be able to get down to go, you know, plus two or three. So you get a very good estimate from that case. So that's actually a key component. Right. If you have any network data, So hopefully your plus here is going to have that whole physical piece that you said. Well, I can make this piece arbitrarily narrow. I can make this right. one percent. But, but practically, yeah, you have to still be visiting. But you still have to be able to use the data to be there and spend time. And so you have that, you have the distribution, and maybe your summary statistics would indicate that you still be able to see that. Something we do in our lab is, you know, create a contract plot where you can have, you know, here's our alpha estimate, here's our sigma squared estimate. Alpha, we find the MLE is here. Okay. We might try a bunch of values around it, and then fill the contract plot. Okay. So the shortcut to figuring out is Visualize the space, and you find out, oh, if there's actually you know, a ridge or something like that. So you can get more in that space. And same thing with Bayesian code, you can have that, that sort of probability density, and you can map that density in the feedback. You can spend years getting your data. Which philosophically is kind of weird. Like, if I put in data, I can go back in time and change what I thought about the system and then go back and change it again. In fact, it may just help you in your analysis.
simply hard to get in the past. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really fine. It's really the other way to sort of peer probation approach where you get fire from the depth. And you have to check it too. Um, but also people will tell if they're unfriendly with fire. Right, so the quick example, if you don't know anything, you have to from zero to one. And all that helps you then is the life of the overall. And that can help in some cases, but in some things like tree branch length, there's no unfriendly with fire. Right? Say a friend goes from zero to infinity, you know, but it has an exponential distribution, fine, but then how long? Other questions or thoughts about this? Yeah. Can you talk about the uh, integration criteria? Yeah, and so, so the various alternatives for AIC, DIC is one, the DIC is another. I don't know enough to say what the you know, kind of activities are, but what the merits are. I know I was talking to you from birth and from the ACPs and 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 the I just have a population of the moment part of it. Right, but, but you hope that if I go the tree in this measure, you can be asked for the tree. It doesn't. Um, so the tree is a little bit of a problem. So we have something where 
where it will allow an arbitrary model to be created by the user. So here he can say he will each discrete time step how the user moves. So he moves by a random normal, right? He moves by a motion. So he moves by a random normal that is displaced by a year. So the displaced by a motion is displaced by a year. And depending on the four parameters in the model, it's some of that are, some of that some of that are exact, right? If you want to get a good estimate for the social state, I think some of that is meaningful. If you want to look at <coughs> the rate, then that can be very information. But it looks like you know, there's these there's different degrees of that. You write something like PC. And all of them are trying to use the increased number of some of the increased number of simulation to be smaller. Yeah. And then how does that look use space even much less? Um, there is one approach that I think is pretty much better. Um, the one approach to estimating particularly I think people choose between Bayesian and likely approach. There's a silly reason. So there's a, some of my silly reasons like I've got a fast program for this. Or I know how to use that. Uh, my friend used it about 10 years. I mean, but it strikes me, it's always struck me, that the difference between them is really a matter of philosophy of science. And it, I, you know, I could argue that Bayesian has some sort of assumption of consensus reality that other methods don't. So the fact that I can produce prior on a parameter um, and that when I publish the paper and say this is my prior, uh, I'm kind of implying that that's your prior too. And if, to the extent that that's what that implies, I'm, I'm assuming that there is we all live in the same consensus reality and we, we all choose. We can reasonably be expected to choose the same five. Uh, anyway, I think there are issues at stake here much bigger than whether this program is faster than most programs. In practice, people choose for all sorts of haphazard reasons. Yeah. And what, what would you argue people should do? We should do? They'll do it my way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think uh, in practice, when we go across the street, we're all basics. We all go through the priors. There's likely to be a car coming at this time of day. Or not, we listen for evidence based on that. And there are various penalties, like a much bigger negative penalty of getting hit by a car than on not crossing the street where we put it. Um, and we put that all together and make a decision to cross the street. And many people say, okay, that means you're lazy. No, it doesn't. Only if you only become lazy when you use. You make a choice among them. you use a controversial prior and report the conclusion, literally, you some science, um, in situations where you, you're kind of assuming that everybody else will like your prior. Now, that may be too restrictive of that. I mean, a lot of people aren't here, but they no, for example, if we're estimating ancestral states for discrete traits, I would point to the we assume that income prior to the year or something like that. I mean, you can do a lot of these things as ad hoc techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and you can formulate some of them where uh, first we estimate something, then we put it in and it generates a prior. Or you can push it back a little bit prior on that prior parameter, and then you're back to the amazing. 
I think when we cross the street, we are all Maisies, but we don't always use the same car. But in, in phylogenetics, it's not the case, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so we've had example, lots of examples where, you know, for Mr. Bayes, it changes prior on branch lengths from a uniform to an exponential, and the fact that the posterior probability is played by a lot. Um, in the sort of the OUBM world, you know, we're working in areas where the delta AAC is like 2, 4. So it's not a lot of likelihood of getting information, and so the prior there will have a good effect. Yeah, well, thank you for yeah. I think in uh, phylogenetic inference, priors on, say, topologies, tree topologies, don't matter terribly much. But priors in brain states can matter a lot. And I, I still think, I'm still worried about being there. Priors in covariance matrices, I was getting at this in the where they build in how much interaction they, they expect between. Some people will say everything interacts with everything. Some people will say no, it's very sparse. Uh, and I think we need to come up with very different priors and get very different inferences out. Um, if I answer the question, could you say that you have a prior that said, I have a new 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 prior that said, Prior, we're assuming that all the off diagonal elements are always exactly the same, it would be a very different prior. You mean separately in each one? Well, you probably have to go, I mean, for covariances, you, you don't just go from zero to one. Um, I, think, I think that priors that say took a random covariance matrix oriented axis at random in space and so on and choosing distributions of eigenvalues that are maybe exponential, would generate matrices that are, have a lot of interaction among a lot of loci. Many, many loci interact with each other. Other people's priors would be on some kind of randomly connected gene network where each gene interacted with only a few other genes. I don't think those are very different. But if you do, at least at this stage, if you can't choose among them, you'll end up with some people drawing very different posteriors One jargon that so you mentioned hyperprior, right? So in the quite open context, we have a prior on priors. We don't have to specify what the prior is for something in the prior to that. Um, so those are discussion points on this. One thing that's one good use of this information approach is this sort of a meta-analysis, right? So we have the field thinks this about some parameter, and we can quantify that as a distribution, then how does my data affect that? Right? But I think that, you know, Amber Ellis assisted all our Angie's films, the prior probability from all those, from all those other studies, uh, the question from other studies of 55%, then how does my new data set change that belief? So you can see it being used in that way, because often not. We don't use the C data sets to get a prior or to pull an LDR. <laughs> I'm so clear about this.
or if you or if you're not building from one, you agree to paper that you could do from your analysis. You can do that from your analysis. Yeah. 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 Ye